My name is Ranger Carlton Smith, and I'll be with you about the next two hours. A uh, time at Andrew Humphreys Division of the Third Corps uh, here in the afternoon of July 2nd. And mostly we're going to be talking about Humphreys' uh, withdrawal from this area. And what he himself had to admit was a trying withdrawal, and probably one he, he didn't want to make. What we're going to do is we're going to come up here towards the Sickles Wounding Monument uh, to set everything up. We're talking about exactly who Andrew Humphreys was, uh, where his division's going to be, and what the backside of his line looked like before he moved up. From here, we're going to go up to the intersection of Sickles Avenue, then head south towards the 73rd New York Monument. Then we're going to come back along Sickles Avenue and cross along the back side of the Emmitsburg Road Ridge, making a couple of stops along there, and then we're going to end up at the Rogers House on the other side of the Emmitsburg Road. And since it is kind of a small group, if at any point in the program you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, and I'll be glad to answer them for you. But for now, let's head up to the Sickles Wounding Monument and find out a little bit more about Andrew Humphreys. Andrew Atkins Humphrey was 53 years old at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, native Pennsylvanian. He graduated from West Point in the class of 1831 and was an engineer. So his whole career prior to the Civil War is in the engineers. He also, uh, joined, at some point in his career, uh, picked up the nickname of Old Google Eyes, which you might tell from there. Also, in some ways, Humphreys uh, reminds me of Captain Quick. If anybody's familiar with the Kane Mutiny. And it's not in the sense that he's playing, thank you, he's playing with the ball bearings and trying to figure out who stole the strawberries. <laughs> when uh, Captain Quick first meets the officers of the Kane, he tells us that you're probably wondering what type of officer I am. He says, anybody who knows me will tell you I'm a book man. So as so long as everybody goes by the book, we're going to be okay. And I think that's what Humphrey says. He's a book man. So as so long as you go by the book, everything's going to be fine. Humphrey's first field command of the Civil War is going to be commanding the 3rd Division of what's part of the 5th Corps. Now, I spoke too soon. We got a horse group coming up behind us. Uh, so we might have to move off a little bit. But he's commanding the 3rd Division of the 5th Corps. His division doesn't join the Corps, though, until the day after the Battle of Antietam. So he misses out on that. His division will fight at Fredericksburg in December of 62. Most of the regiments in Humphrey's division is made up of nine-month men, and that's it. And Humphreys apparently does not have a high opinion of them. And he also doesn't like that they're not following the book, following Army regulations. In fact, after the Battle of Fredericksburg, he ordered Colonel Jacob Frick of the 129th Pennsylvania to order his men to buy the Army dress uniform. Now, those things cost about $12. And a private got paid $13 a month. The unit's going to be dismissed in about May or June. And Frick says he's not going to order his men to buy a uniform coat they might wear once, and that's it. So Humphreys is going to place Frick under arrest. He then ordered the Lieutenant Colonel, William Armstrong, to give the same order. And Armstrong refused to follow it. And Humphreys is going to place him under arrest as well. And I think at this point we need to move off the, the track just a little bit. I see more horses today yeah. than in all my trips That's here for you. Really? <laughs> must, be, must be the weekend, I guess. But probably the weekend. Actually, uh, it's better than if you were here in 1863. <laughs> uh, the two armies came to Gettysburg with something close to 70,000 horses. And one horse can consume up to 10 gallons of water a day. So 700,000 gallons of water a day just for the horses. And one horse can leave behind 10 pounds of manure a day. Oh, fun. So almost a ton and a half of manure by the time the armies leave here. 
and we'll let them get past us. Part of Frick and Lieutenant Colonel Arms are now placed under arrest and they're going to be court martialed. Now, both Frick and Armstrong are members of the volunteer army. They're volunteer officers. And according to army regulations, volunteer officers, if they're court martialed, are supposed to be tried by fellow volunteer officers, not regular army officers. But the War Department had a policy that regular army officers could take a leave of absence to accept commissions in the volunteer army. So guess who all the officers are on the court martial board? They're regular army officers sitting in their guise as volunteer officers. That's how they got around it. Uh, Frickin' Armstrong are going to be convicted, uh, but Governor Curtin got the sentences modified. And actually during the Gettysburg campaign, Colonel Frick will command the Pennsylvania militia over at Wrightsville, Pennsylvania, and he's the guy who orders the bridge over there burned. So the Confederates can't capture it and get across the Susquehanna River. Now, Humphreys was also described as a soldier to courage of the brightest order, both moral and physical. He united the energy, decision, and intellectual power which characterized him in civil administration. And the Assistant Secretary of War, though, did say that Humphreys and Sherman were men of distinguished and brilliant profanity. <laughs> so there's two sides of the sky. The third division of the Fifth Corps is going to be discontinued after the Battle of Chancellorsville, because all those nine-month guys now are going home. As a parting gift for Humphreys, uh, one of the Pennsylvania units reportedly took uh, the cartridge boxes they had, emptied the black powder in a trail up to Humphreys' tent, and then set fire to it. So you got this <laughs> smoke running towards the general's tent, no explosion or anything, but that was their way of saying goodbye. <laughs> and one officer said that Humphreys was a very bad thing in the sequel, but before and during the battle, it is a fine thing. Now Humphreys, when General Meade took command of the army on June 28th, he wanted Humphreys to serve as his chief of staff. Humphreys turned it down to continue to command his division in the coming battle. And Humphreys here would command a division of three brigades that totals 4,924 officers and men. One of his brigades, Burling, were going to have to take off the map because they're going to be scattered all over the place. So the only units he commands up here are Brewster and Carr. So between those two brigades, he has 3,555 officers and men backed up by two batteries of artillery. And Humphreys did not have an easy time getting here. On July 1st, he's posted down in, in Emmitsburg, Maryland, on the west side of town. And he receives orders to move to Gettysburg. Since he's on the west side of, of town, Humphreys doesn't move through town to get up on the Emmitsburg Pike. He decides to take a back road. which means he's going to leave on the track road west of Emmitsburg and start to come towards Gettysburg. He crosses a stream on a, on a covered bridge, and once he gets across that, he takes out the map he has. Now, it's already after sunset, and through the light of a cannery, he looks at this map, and he tells Lieutenant Colonel Hayden, a staff officer from the Third Corps, that if they move to the right a little bit, they're going to connect with the Emmitsburg Road in the area of the Peach Orchard, and they'll be with the rest of the Army. Lieutenant Colonel Hayden, who's supposed to direct the column, says, no, that's not where you're supposed to go. I know where you're supposed to go, so listen to me. And eventually, Humphreys does. They now get on the Gettysburg Campground Road and end up on the Fairfield Road heading towards town. Now, by that time, even Colonel Hayden is beginning to question where they're going. So Humphreys stops the column. And he's going to ride up with a private, uh, with a private from uh, the six from the six U.S. Cavalry, one of his uh, one of his messengers, and they go up to the Black Horse Tavern, and the owner tells them that on the ridge behind them, on Breams Hill, 
their Confederate troops. So Humphreys goes back to the other column and he's going to order them doing about face. And they're supposed to do all this as quietly as possible. Well, of course, not everybody gets the word. And at least one bugler sent out his bugle to turn everybody around. Apparently nobody else heard it though, at least not the Confederates. So Humphreys will bring his two brigades into this area late on, or late on July 1st, very early morning of July 2nd. And he's going to go into position in the fields right behind us. His third brigade under Burling will leave Emmitsburg on the morning of July 2nd and arrive in this area about noon. So they're getting in very late. You always have to remember that the Third Corps is under the command of Major General Dan Sickles. And Dan Sickles himself is the only Corps commander in the Army of the Potomac who is not a West Point graduate. Uh, Sickles was actually a professional lawyer and a professional politician more than anything else. At the beginning of the war, though, he raised five regiments of New York troops. And as a reward for that, President Lincoln made him a Brigadier General. And then later on promoted him to Major General. So Sickles is actually one of the ranking generals on the field. Uh, technically, he even outranks General Meade, the Army commander. The only regular officer in the Third Corps is going to be Andrew Humphreys, of any, who has any authority. But there's no evidence that Sickles ever conferred with Humphreys as to what he thought. And so General Sickles believes he knows better than all these West Point trained generals. Now, General Meade orders Sickles to place the Third Corps on Cemetery Ridge right behind us, where you see the cars going. His right is to connect with the Second Corps over near the Pennsylvania Monument, and his left flank is to rest on Little Round Top behind us. There's no evidence, though, that Sickles ever had any troops on Little Round Top, and there's no evidence Sickles himself was on Little Round Top. Instead, Sickles becomes concerned with the Emmitsburg Road Ridge out here to the west of us. And that ridge line is higher than the ground he occupies back there. So Sickles is afraid the Confederates will occupy this high ground, plant artillery up there, and then show his line. That's what he's worried about. But over at the Peach Orchard to the southwest of us is John Buford's cavalry division, two brigades. They're the ones who opened the fight on July 1st. They're now guarding the left flank of the Union line. And in front of them across the Emmitsburg Road in the area of the Warfield House, the 63rd Pennsylvania has a strong skirmish line established with the skirmish reserve in the road itself. So Sickles isn't that concerned at this point. But at 10.30 in the morning, John Buford receives orders to take us cavalry and withdraw to Tarnytown, Maryland, to re-equip and reorganize. Buford himself has requested this. This is a request made to General Meade by the Chief of Cavalry, General Pleasanton. And Meade told Pleasanton you can let Buford do that, provided you replace Buford with more cavalry. And Pleasanton doesn't do that. So by 11.30 in the morning, Buford, or excuse me, at 11.30 in the morning, Sickles now sees his cavalry screen leaving his front and left flank. So he sends a patrol across the Emmitsburg Road into Pitzer's Woods. And they encounter a Confederate division moving into position. So Sickles is now convinced the Confederates are heading for the ridge, playing artillery, and so is Long. So he's going to order General Burney, commanding the 1st Division, to move out occupy part of the Emmitsburg Road Ridge down to the Peach Orchard. But then there's a 500-yard gap in Sickles Line from the Peach Orchard down to a place called the Stony Hill. From the Stony Hill, the line picks up and runs down to a place called Devil's Den. So Sickles' left flank, instead of resting on Little Round Top, is in front of it at Devil's Den. Meanwhile, Humphrey's division will be posted in the fields behind us, and they start moving up the ridge line towards Emmitsburg Road. The first Massachusetts, about 11 o'clock in the morning, is sent out to the Emmitsburg Road, across the road, 
to act on the skirmish line. They were under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Clark Bardwin. And Bardwin had a sore on his left ankle, and he was in the hospital. When he heard the campaign was going on, and he's constantly asking the doctors to release him so he can rejoin his regiment. And the doctors at first kept turning him down. But apparently Colonel Baldwin was pretty persistent. And the doctors finally released him from the hospital so Baldwin can rejoin his regiment on the field, still with a sore ankle. So he's not going to let that slow him down at all. About midday, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Humphreys struck to occupy the western slope of the Emmitsburg Road. Carr is going to be in front of us with the 72nd New York on his left near what's now United States Avenue. Brewster is going to be 200 yards in the rear and Burley 200 yards in the rear of that, which places them down pretty much where the thicket is today. Burley, though, now is going to receive orders to support Bernie's line. So Bernie's going to move from there over into the Trosa Woods on the south side of United States Avenue. Then he's moved a little bit further down towards the Wheatfield Road. Once he's there, he now receives orders to bring the brigade out into the open fields. Bernie does that. A does it, he's singing with the intention of trying to expose the Confederate artillery. And almost as soon as Burling pulls out of the woods, the Confederate artillery starts to open fire and starts hitting his brigade. So Burling does what he thinks is a smart thing and moves back into the woods for protection. A staff officer from General Sickles now rides up, wants to know who's ordered the brigade back into the woods. And Burling says, I did. And the staff officer says, that's not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be out in the open field. So Burling gets ready to move back out again when he receives orders to move across the Wheatfield Road into Rose's Woods. And that's when he's going to start to lose his command. And we've got the horses coming back, uh, so you're going to have to move off the road again, I'm afraid. While Burley is in Rose's Woods, he gets an order to send two regiments to help Graham at the Peach Orchard. He's going to send the 5th New Jersey back here to Humphreys. One regiment is sent to Colonel Ward down in Devil's Den. The 8th New Jersey is sent to Colonel de Torbian near the Stony Hill. That leaves him with 115th Pennsylvania, which is also sent to de Torbian. So in a very short amount of time, Burling, who had six regiments, now suddenly has no regiments. And he's a brigade commander with no brigade. So he comes back to report to General Humphreys and asks Humphreys, what do you want me to do? And Humphreys' attitude basically is, you don't have any troops, so I have no use for you. So kind of fall back to the rear and we'll find out what to do with you later. So Humphreys now not only loses a brigade, he loses the services of a good brigade commander at the same time. Now, General Meade, the Army commander, didn't know what Sickles had done. And he calls the meeting for his corps commanders at Army headquarters at 3 o'clock in the afternoon of July 2nd. That's when Meade finds out what Sickles has done. He's going to order the 5th Corps over to the area of the Little Round Top. But he's not sure how soon they can get there. So at the same time, he sends an order out here for Humphreys to take his division and move to the Little Round Top. Humphreys is going to send a staff officer to Meade to reconfirm, reconfirm the orders. Because if Humphreys moves, there's going to be a gap in the line between the Second Corps and Burney's division up near the Peach Orchard. But Humphreys is going to follow General Meade's orders. He gets his two, right, he gets his two brigades over here in a column, starts to move out under Confederate artillery fire. And then we see, and then the staff officer comes back, countermanding Meade's orders. So Humphreys to go back into position. So again, under fire, he turns the two brigades around and comes back into position. Under the eyes of everybody on Cemetery Ridge. So they all saw Humphreys' ability to command his division. 
out here in the field. And if you look up here to the west of us, you're looking at the Emmitsburg Road Ridge. The red barn directly in front of us is the barn for the Klingo House. And that sits on the Emmitsburg Road. To the right and left of that is going to be Humphrey's Line. That's his main line, a Colonel Carr's Brigade. It's going to be up there. His right flank is going to rest about 300 yards south of the Katori Barn. And if you look to the north of us, that big red barn is the Katori Farm. So Humphrey's Line will be 300 yards short of that along the Emmitsburg Road. And actually looking directly north, those two white buildings you can see in the distance, that's the Bryan Farm, which sits at the northern end of Cemetery Ridge. So Cemetery Ridge is the ridge line running back behind us along the main road. And that's where Sickles was supposed to be. And today he's going to be out here. His right flank now is three quarters of a mile in front of Cemetery Ridge and the Union Army Second Corps, his closest support. We talked about this 300 yard gap at the Peach Orchard, and his left flank resting on Devil's Den is in military terms in the air. It's not anchored on anything. Devil's Den is a very impressive rock formation, but that's all it is. The den itself is of no military value whatsoever. It's completely indefensible in many ways. So both ends of Sickles line are in the air at this point. Now part of Sickles reasoning for moving out here, as he's going to state, is he didn't have enough men to man the cemetery ridge line he was assigned. The problem is, by moving out here, his line is twice as long. But being a good lawyer, he never explained how, if he didn't have enough men to man that line, how he was going to man the forward line. Uh, that's one question he never really answered to anybody's satisfaction. But we're back here at what amounts to Sickles headquarters during most of the battle. At one point in the battle, Sickles is going to get hit in the leg by shell fire, about where the monument is behind us. He's going to have to be taken off the field as his left leg's going to be amputated at that point, which means Sickles will be the first high-ranking officer back to Washington, D.C. And he promptly tells everybody, including the president, his version of events. And as it turns out, his version of events is he moved out here because General Meade was getting ready to leave. There's no evidence of that, but that's what Sickles said. And that, and even in the post-war years, he's going to keep that up. Uh, Sickles, as it turns out, would be the last Corps commander of the Army of the Potomac. And he passed away in 1914, 51 years after the battle and 51 years after he lost his leg. Uh, but Sickles donated that leg uh, to the new Army Medical Museum. Uh, unlike most soldiers, when the Dodgers amputated Sickles' leg, they didn't just throw it off on a pile. They buried it separately in case the general wanted it back. And he did. So his staff came back, retrieved the bones, and gave it to the Army Medical Museum, which is still one of those popular exhibits in the museum. Is that at Walter Reed? What, what used to be Walter Reed. Okay. Yeah, so you can still go down to the medical museum and see General Sickles' leg, if you have a mind to. What we're going to do is come down here to the Emmitsburg Road, or excuse me, down here to United States Avenue. And one thing you want to keep in mind about United States Avenue is as you go through the battlefield, any place that's marked as a road, like the Emmitsburg Road or the Wheatfield Road, we're here at the time of the battle. And Avenue is a post-battle road. But on this stretch of U.S. Avenue, that's also the original farm lane for the Tulsa farm. When you get to the other side, it's going to change. And several years ago, we reestablished the original Tulsa lane as part of the horse trail. So you want to keep that in mind, especially in the action taking place behind us later on and where some of these troops are going to be. Because the monuments for those units on where they're supposed to be. But that's a whole nother story. Okay, it's got nothing to do with Humphreys necessarily. So again, what we're gonna do is come down here to the US Avenue, we'll take a right, head towards the intersection of Sickles Avenue, we'll make a brief stop there, 
make sure everybody's still with us. And then we head down to the monument of the 73rd New York. It's not in Humphrey's line necessarily, but the 73rd is part of Humphrey's division. So we're going to see why Humphrey sent those guys over there and then come back to Humphrey's main line. The United States Avenue essentially remarked the left flank of Humphrey's line. At one point, he had the 72nd New York from Bruce's brigade up here on his left because Carr's brigade didn't, couldn't cover the whole line. So he had Carr's brigade basically along Demonsburg Road, then the 72nd, Pen uh, 72nd New York. Most of Brewster's brigade, the Excelsior Brigade, were back here in the fields in support. But Humphreys does get a request for a regiment to be sent over to help Bernie at the Peach Orchard. And he's going to attach the 73rd New York. So I know some of you got nice and comfortable on your seats. We're going to move. Well, we're going to move. <laughs> so there you go. So we're going to be moving down Sickles Avenue, and there is a mowed path that would take us up to the 73rd New York. Once there, we get a better view of the peach orchard, what's going on over there, and how that's going to start to affect Humphrey's line at this end. Now, just to the south of us is the Peach Orchard proper. And where that car is going is the Wheatfield Road. So Bernie will have some of his division along this stretch of the Emmitsburg Road through the Peach Orchard, but then it stops at the south end of the Peach Orchard. There's a 500 yard gap, and then it picks up at the, at the Stony Hill and runs down to Devil's Den. Sickles apparently was hoping to cover that gap with a strong skirmish line backed up by artillery along the Wheatfield Road itself. The woods across from us helped mark Seminary Ridge, and as you move south, you get onto Warfield Ridge. Long Street will have his two divisions in position by about 3.30 in the afternoon of July 2nd. That's when his artillery starts to open fire. And the artillery aimed at the Peach Orchard is about 600 yards away. So among other things, the artillery is also exchanging canister fire at long range. At about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Longstreet's attack is going to start. And it starts with Hood's division a little bit further south. And Hood's division, because of where they are, are going to end up attacking Devil's Den, hitting Little Round Top, which if you look to the east of us, at the edge of Rose's Woods, to that gap, you can just see the south slope, or excuse me, the north slope of Little Round Top. So Hood's guys are heading for Devil's Den, Little Round Top. They also make the first fight in the wheat field. And the wheat field is just beyond Rose's Woods here to the east of us. Once Hood's attack is well developed, Kershaw South Carolinians from McClaw's division are going to be sent forward. And their job is to hit the backside of the Peach Orchard and aim towards Union batteries along the Wheatfield Road. The two regiments on Kershaw's right start to crowd each other. So Kershaw gave an order for those two regiments to do a right flank, to straighten them out. It was only meant for those two regiments. Somehow the order got transferred to the other three regiments. So now those three regiments, instead of heading directly towards the guns on the Wheatfield Road, turn and headed back towards the Rose Woods. Kershaw is going to call up uh, General Simpson's brigade in support. And they now have marched an attack, launched an attack into Rose Woods, into the area of the Stony Hill which means the Kershaw and Sims are behind the Peach Orchard line up here. 
At that point or shortly afterwards, General Barksdale's Mississippians are now going to be turned loose to attack this area. And they're the ones who will eventually sweep through the Peach Orchard itself. Trying to stop them is the 114th Pennsylvania, posted up here near the main road. And coming up in support of the 114th is going to be the 73rd New York. The lieutenant colonel of the 114th is actually Federico Fernandez Caveda. He was actually Cuban. Uh, his father was a Cuban merchant who married an American in Cuba. Uh, both Federico and his brother Adolfo were born in Cuba. The father died in 1838, at which point the mother moved the family back to her hometown of Philadelphia. And that's where the boys grew up. Frederick's command, the 114th Pennsylvania here, Adolfo was a staff officer with the rank of captain on Humphrey's staff. So both brothers are serving the war now of their adopted country. And the 73rd would like to open fire on Barksdale's men, but the 114th is in front of them. So they can't do that. They had to wait for the 114th to clear the front before they could open fire at probably a range of 100 yards or less. Uh, they serve as close range. And they greeted Barksdale, though, with a volley, which means the entire regiment is going to fire at once. The two color bears, though, for the 73rd are going to be shot and go down. And Major Michael Burns was riding behind the line, making sure his men are being steady in the fire. But now they receive an order to rejoin Humphreys on the main line. So Barksdale's move has cleared the Peach Orchard area. Union troops there are falling back. Union troops on Bernie's line are also starting to fall back at this point. When the 73rd clears the area, three of Barksdale's four regiments are going to turn and head towards the flank of Humphrey's line. The 21st Mississippi is going to head more in the direction of the Tulsa farm and would take on the 9th Mass Battery. And then they'll move from there to try to capture a second battery along the way. But the other three regiments of Barksdale's brigade are now heading towards the flank of Humphrey's division. So Brewster's brigade now is going to be turned to face that new threat with Carr's brigade still facing west along the Emmitsburg Road. Before we leave here, does anybody have any questions about the terrain, what I've said, or about where troops might be or where they're heading for? No? Everything's clear as mud, right? <laughs> okay. Remember, Hood's division is heading towards the Round Tops and Devil's Den and made the first incursions into the wheat field. Kershaw and Sims are going to be moving towards the wheat field. Barksdale's men are heading in this general direction. And then Walfer's brigade of, of McClaw's division, his last brigade, will move into the area of the wheat field, oh, excuse me, move into the area of the peach orchard, head straight down the wheat field road, helping to clear the wheat field and moving towards the base of Little Round Top. So Confederate troops here are pushing west, excuse me, they're pushing east towards the Union line. And once also, once the peach orchard is clear, Confederate artillery was starting to set up over there and open fire. The Confederate artillery, though, thought this was the main line. And all they had to do was a mopping up operation. But they realized once they got to the peach orchard and looked behind them along Cemetery Ridge that this was not the main line. The main line was still behind them. And he said there were still lots of troops and a lot more fighting yet to do. So to them it yeah. would have looked like a defense in depth. It would have looked like a defense in depth. Sickles out here and the main line in the rear. Yeah, Sickles at one time claimed that he was forming a breakwater out here. <laughs> but somebody pointed out a breakwater is designed to defend something behind it. Yes. And when Sickles moved out, there was nothing behind him to defend. So again, that analogy is kind of out. Are you going to talk about the flank markers here? The thing with Batchelder? Where Later on. Later on, okay. Right. Yeah, there's, there's a story with, with John Batchelder and one particular regiment, but it's not the 73rd. That's a little bit further down. 
Yes, sir. The Excelsior Brigade originally had six regiments back by the road. How many are going to end up? They're, they're actually, how, that, how the brigade marker got there, we don't know. Because the only regiment from the Excelsior Brigade on this part of the field is the 73rd New York. The rest of the brigade is supporting Humphrey's line. But Sickles had moved forward in like three stages. I right. It was the most advanced stage when they still had skirmishers out front before the fighting. Right. But Brewster is part of Humphrey's division. So he, so it's Carr's brigade and then Brewster in support. So, so yeah, why? So it's one of those questions. Why the Excelsior Brigade is there? I don't know. Okay, so they were never really there. I've always wondered about right. that. If they were there, they put up a real lousy defense. But their main fight's over there. Is over there. But right, the only regiment from the from the Excelsior Brigade is the 73rd. Up here. Right. Okay, thank you. Well, anything else? All right. What we're going to do is follow this path back down. We'll head again back towards the intersection and make a brief stop there before we start running down Humphrey's line. I wanted to stop here. I uh, talk about one regiment, even though it's not part of Humphrey's line, and that's the 105th Pennsylvania, which is stationed up here right by the Emmitsburg Road, and the monument sort of behind the tree we're looking at right now. 105th Pennsylvania is also the Wildcat Regiment. But they're facing south when Barksdale's Brigade starts to break through, and their colonel said that, they, that he rallied his men eight or ten times, and they made one or two charges to try to stop Barksdale's brigade. And the colonel said the boys fought like demons. The eventually they're going to be, they're going to be stopped and the 105th is going, to be, is going to be forced back. So they're going to start to retreat. But they're trying to buy some time up here, maybe for Humphreys. But they're going to pay for it. The 105th Pennsylvania had 274 officers and men. They reported losses of 132. Just over 48% of what they brought in. Humphreys is always going to report, I was about to throw somewhat forward the left of my infantry and engage the enemy with it. When I received orders from General Burney to throw back my left and form a line oblique to and in rear of the one I then held. So Humphreys was getting ready to charge at this point. When he now gets an order from General Burney, with sickles down, Burney takes command of the Third Corps. So he's the guy issuing orders now. And he wants Humphreys to refuse his left flank to start forming a new line. So instead of advancing, Humphreys has to pull back a little bit, try to defend this, from this attack by General Barksdale. And Humphreys is not at all happy with the situation down here, especially after he lost Burley's brigade. And I have a comment from Humphreys uh, towards the end about what he thought of all this. We're going to continue from here and go down to the 120th New York Monument, uh, this little stone structure right in front of us. And once there, we'll talk about Bruce's line back here in the field, and we'll also talk about one of the controversies as to monument placement after the Civil War. With Barksdale now coming in from that direction, uh, Humphreys has to move Bruce's brigade over here try to defend his left flank. Colonel Cowswell McClellan of the 120th was told to get his men back in the line and keep them there. But, and they also saw General Burney uh, ride in the opposite direction from the general line. And they found that a general route of Burney's division was in progress. So they're worried now that those men from Burney are going to come through the line and disrupt Brewster's line, which is exactly what's going to happen. Well, the front regiment gave way, and, but the 120 is going to bring Barksdale to a halt. Brewster was unhorsed uh, with the file closers. Humphreys and Lieutenant Colonel Cornelius Westbrook were also both behind the line. And Westbrook now is mad at General Carr up here along the road. 
because he can't understand why Carr is not sending troops down to help him out. But Carr is going to have his own problems, so we want to find out. One of the controversies, and also the Excelsior Brigade, uh, the units down here, don't write a lot about what they're doing here on July 2nd. And somebody said there's two reasons for that. Uh, one is uh, they either didn't do a lot, or they're doing something you don't want anybody to know about. And in fact, when, when Bernie's guys are charging through here, they are starting to break up Brewster's Brigade, Brewster's Brigade a little bit. And some of these New York troops are going to be caught up in that general retreat. In the post-war years, a man named John Batchelder was the first official historian of the battlefield. And the battlefield commissioners made him, put him in charge of the placement of the monuments on the battlefield. So Mr. Batchelder decided where the monuments are going to go. Uh, he's going to get into an argument with some regiments about that, including the 120th New York. And I don't know exactly where Mr. Batchelder wanted to put it, but the 120th New York went out and put the monument right here in front of us. They said that's where they were in the field. We think to get back at them, Batchelder is going to reverse the flank markers. Okay? Now remember, the 120th New York is supposed to be facing that way against the enemy. The small stone here is the left flank of the 120th. So you think the right flank is over there. It's not. The right flank is in this field. Which means if you go by the flank markers, here's the left, there's the right, the 120th New York back is to the enemy. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. But that's how John Batchelder put it. And that was his revenge, if you will, for the 120th veterans winning out on where to place their monument. But the 120th is facing towards the enemy, and they're part of Bruce's brigade that's going to start to eventually break and fall apart. Now, as I said, Colonel Westbrook was, was mad because Carr is not sending any troops down to help him. And there's a good reason for that. Carr himself wrote, at that time, I have no doubt that he could have charged on the rebels and driven them in confusion. For my line was still perfect and unbroken and my troops in the proper spirit for the performance of such a task. Now, as it turns out, there's a good reason Carr isn't sending anybody down here to help out Brewster, because Carr is going to have his own troubles along the Emmitsburg Road. We're going to continue up here. We'll cut through the orchard a little bit, head towards Emmitsburg Road and towards the marker for Sealy's battery on the road itself. And once up there, we get a better view of a car scene across the ridge line, and why I can't send anybody down here to help out Brewster. But before we leave, again, does anybody have any questions real quick? Everything's so clear as mud, right? <laughs> yeah. Remember at this point, we have Barksdale coming in from this direction. The other Confederate troops are clearing the wheat field at this point, making it a no man's land. And there's other Confederate troops now attacking along the Emmitsburg Road. So we've got Barksdale coming from this way, and soon Confederate troops coming from that direction as well. So let's go up here and get a better view of what Carr is seeing. From up here, you can start to see some more of the terrain. Looking behind us, for example, you can now see a little round top. The Tulsa Barn's right behind us. The George Wyckett Farm is almost directly east of us. And you can also see the Pennsylvania Monument and Cemetery Ridge behind us. In front of us, what Colonel Carr is going to see is Warcox's Brigade of Alabamans now coming directly towards him. <coughs> the 11th New Jersey posted south of Sealy's Battery is going to be turned to face Barksdale. The color guard is going to be posted roughly 20 yards in front of the regiment for inspiration. But as the fighting heats up, the other New Jersey has to retreat. When they retreated, though, somebody forgot the color guard. So they're still out there. They finally sent somebody back, and they found the color guard still at the post, waiting for everybody else. So they get, managed to get the color guard off the field.
Captain Gervada of, of Humphrey's staff is going to report, our batteries open, our troops rose to their feet, the crash of artillery and the, and the tearing rattle of our musketry were staggering and added to the noise on our side, the advancing roar and cheer of the enemy's masses coming on like devils incarnate. So remember, you got Barksdale coming in from that direction and Warcox's brigade now coming in from that direction. That's why Carr can't send anybody down to tell Brewster. He's got his own problems up here. Now, Colonel Gervader, or Lieutenant Colonel Gervader of the 114th Pennsylvania, is going to be wounded and captured. In the post war years, both brothers served as U.S. consuls in Cuba. And in 1868, they're going to join the Cuban War for Independence, what was called the Ten Years' War. Federico was made commander of all the Cuban forces. He's going to be captured and executed in July of 1871. Alfredo is going to be killed in action in December of 1871. So both brothers, after serving the Civil War, go back to their home, their native country, and fight for independence there, and will be killed in trying to do that. Humphreys himself is up here with Steely's battery, trying to direct the battery itself, and said so he walked among the guns giving directions and elevations to the giving directions, oblivious to the murderous missiles that were filling the very gunners around him. Seely himself is going to get hit in the chest and seriously wounded. Lieutenant Robert James would take over command of the battery. The 5th New Jersey had been out on the skirmish line. They actually relieved the 63rd Pennsylvania. They're covering the front of the division along with the 1st Massachusetts. They're going to retire from that and form in rear of Seely's battery try to give it some protection. Sealy's left is going to become engaged and they're driven in. Eventually, Sealy's battery is going to have to pull out of here. Joseph Carr himself said that notwithstanding my apparent critical position, I could and would have maintained my position, but for an order received direct from General, Major General Burney. And what Burney wants these guys to do now is form a new line trying to connect with the line being formed in the area of the round tops. So they're going to pull back from this central position to a fence line and try to make that connection as best they can. What we're going to do is move off the hillside here, continue down Sickles Avenue, we'll stop in the rear near the path going up to the Klingler Farm, talk about the withdrawal of the 12th New Hampshire, then move down to Turnbull's Battery, from there, we'll cross the Emmitsburg Road and go up onto the Rogers Farm site. And there, we're we'll talking about the end of the battle and what's going to happen to Humphreys after the Battle of Gettysburg. At this point, Sealy's battery is going to be forced to withdraw as well. And they're trying to get out of here the best way they can. Sealy's battery is, a, is one of those that's going to try to retreat by prolong. Every gun has an 8-foot rope attached to it. And you can take one end of that rope, put it on the trail of the gun, and attach the other end to the hook on the limber. And what that allows you to do is load the gun while you're retreating and fire it. So you can try to fire the gun, they can stop, fire the gun, keep going and load it to try to slow down the enemy advance. So that's what Sealy's battery is trying to do. The 12th New Hampshire is back here. And Carr sent a staff officer to Captain Langley, who was in command of the regiment. And he has directions on how the regiment's supposed to withdraw and where they're supposed to go. And the staff officer asked Captain Langley if he could make the men understand the order. Well, if he understood the order. He said, yes, if I can make them understand the order. But now he starts trying to shout the order to the regiment, laying the go to each regimental commander with the instructions. So he's got 10 guys he has to talk to. And in the midst of that, anything can happen. Laying the could go down before he tells everybody what's going on. The captain he tells might go down before he can tell anybody else. So there's all types of things that can go wrong. Apparently though, nothing went wrong. Langley told everybody what they were gonna do 
and at a given bugle call, the regiment got up and started to retreat. But Sergeant Luther Parker, with the state flag, is going to be mortally wounded. Sergeant William Howe, with the U.S. flag, is going to be killed in action. Corporal John Davis is going to take the U.S. flag from Howe's hand. But Howe, who had grasped the flag itself, didn't want to let go. So they, had, they actually had to yank the flag out of his hand. And they left a 12 by 15 inch patch of the flag in Howe's hand. That's how tight a grip he had on it. And even though he's dead, he's not going to let it go. But the 12 Dewey Hams was able to pull out of here. And of 224 men, they suffered 92 casualties, about 41% by the time they got out of here. Brewster himself was trying to get off behind his line. His horse was killed and he started walking off the field when a, cap, when a corporal, excuse me, with Captain Thomas Rafferty of the 71st New York. When a private in the 71st came up to Brewster and gave Brewster the bridle from his horse. So Brewster lost his horse, but his private made sure he got the bridle for the colonel. So he at least had that on the retreat. What we're going to do now is continue on down towards the right of Humphrey's line. We're talking about the original position of Turbo's battery and point out where Humphrey's line was supposed to set up according to David Burning. And actually I can do that from right here. We have this Virginia rail fence along the horse trail. The next fence over that post and rail fence is where Humphrey's supposed to set up. And that rail fence does go in an angle down towards the round tops. And that's where Bernie wants Humphreys to set up if he can at this point. But even there, Humphreys is going to have a tough time following out his orders. So we're going to continue down and turn with his battery, tell you where they actually were in the battlefield, and then head over across Simmonsburg Road uh, to the shade trees near the Rogers house. And there we're talking about the division at the end of the battle and what happens to Humphreys after Gettysburg. Bernie's brigade will end up retreating all the way back towards the Pennsylvania Monument behind us. The monument right in front of us and the guns up here represent Turnbow's battery. Now the question is, why is Turnbow's battery over here? Because you can't see anything. The answer is they're not here. They're on the other side of the road. So they're on top of the ridge line looking off towards the east. But when they get the order to fall back, they always are going to fix prolong and start heading back towards the Plum One Swell behind us. And it's about a 400 yard run to get back there. They have to leave four pieces on the field and two case on they can't get them off. But they also retry, as I said, re retreating by prolong try to slow down the advance as best they can. Turnbull will also see action in the next stage, July 3rd. His gun is going to be posted further north on Cemetery Ridge uh, near the statue of General Meade. So if you go up, go up by General Meade, you'll see a monument similar to this one to Turnbull's battery on July 3rd. So they might be falling back, but they're not out of action by any means. But Colonel Bardner of the 1st Massachusetts, whose regiment was on skirmish duty across the road, is going to report the enemy's front line of battle appeared on the riser ground in our front and fired a terrible volley into our ranks. So now the 1st Mass on the skirmish line is forced to withdraw as well. So most of Humphrey's line now is starting to fall back. He's going to place himself on the Emmitsburg Road and supervise the withdrawal from that position which is probably why his statue is on the Emmitsburg Road, directly to the north of us. What we're going to do is come down here to the intersection with the Emmitsburg Road, and I like to wait till everybody's with us, and then we'll cross the road as a group and go into the shade of the trees where the Rogers house used to be. Talk about the end of the day on July 2nd and what's going to happen to Humphreys when the battle is over.
and this is the hardest part to talk on the whole on the whole walk. But Humphreys, as I mentioned, is going to be on the Emmitsburg Road supervising cars withdrawal, which is why his monument is just across the road from us. Carr himself, or Humphreys, reported that his horse was hit seven times by shot and shell. Private James Diamond of the 6th U.S. Cavalry, Humphreys' orderly, uh, the guy who went with him out to the Black Horse Tavern the night before, is going to come up and even though he's been wounded, give his horse to the general. So Humphreys will have that horse. After that, Private Diamond kind of disappears. We don't know what happened to him. We presume he was killed out here, but since he was on Humphrey's staff, he wasn't on the muster row for the 6th U.S. Cavalry. And because he was with the 6th U.S. Cavalry temporarily with Humphrey's staff, the staff didn't keep track of him either. So Diamond's one of those guys that kind of fell between the tracks. And we don't know exactly what happened to him. We believe he was killed and buried in the National Cemetery under an unknown grave. But Humphreys himself does want to know what happened to Private Diamond. And he actually wrote to the uh, Surgeon General for any information he had on the whereabouts and what happened to Private Diamond. And Humphreys himself never found out. Again, we don't know exactly what happened to him. But Humphreys is not as lean as brigade out, as lean as division out here. And he himself reported that 20 times did I bring my men to a halt and face about. My face, myself and Harry, his son, and others of my staff forced the men to it. So the units just aren't falling back. Humphreys is having them stop, turn around, and fire on their pursuers, try to slow down the Confederate advance. Remember, you had Barksdale coming in, Wilcox coming across the field, and Lang's Brigade of Floridans coming across the field as well. Now, those three brigades, Barksdale, Wilcox, and Lang, number about 4,000 men. Humphreys, with just Brewster and Carr, number 3,500. So he's not being overwhelmed by numbers, but it's the position that has him tied up now. Barks are coming in, hitting the flank. At the same time, Wilcox coming in to hit the front. Plus, he has these orders from Bernie to fall back and try to form a new line. But it's not going to be enough. Eventually, Humphrey's division falls back behind the Pennsylvania Monument and it will start to reform. Now, Humphreys, at the start of all this, had been told he can call and call to his division of the Second Corps for support. So when the attack starts, he sends an aide back to get Caldwell support. And the aide come back, comes back with the report that Caldwell isn't there. Caldwell, as far as Humphreys knew, was at the Pennsylvania Monument. But Caldwell had received orders to move down to the wheat field. So that's why Humphreys now has no support immediately in the rear. But coming down from Cemetery Ridge is going to be the 82nd New York and the 15th Mass. And they go into position on the north side of the Gadori House and Barn. Brown's battery will also advance to the rear of the 15th Mass, again north of the Gadori Farm. Thomas's battery is going to be near the Pennsylvania Monument, and they start opening fire. They are the first Minnesota in support. Weir's battery is going to go into position on this side of the Godori Barn, with the 19th Maine in support. The 42nd New York and the 19th Mass will also come down in support of Weir's battery, and they're actually going to mount a charge try to drive back the Confederates before they turn around and start to head back. But, but all this is going to help clear the front of Humphrey's line. And once Humphrey falls back, those two regiments fire a volley to try to stop the Confederate advance. Also, now coming out from just south of the Pennsylvania Monument, Willard's Brigade of New Yorkers, 1,500 strong, will advance to start Barksdale. 
The 1st Minnesota advances to stop Wilcox's brigade. And the 13th Vermont is going to claim to advance all the way out to Emmitsburg Road to where we are. And so the cause regiment's going to rally and also advance back out here to the Emmitsburg Road. Humphreys, though, is going to reform this division on the crest just south of the Pennsylvania Monument. He's going to send out pickets and get ready for more battle. Humphreys is going to write to his wife, had my division left intact, I should have driven the enemy back, but the ruinous habit, it doesn't deserve the name of system, of putting troops into position and then drawing off its reserves and second line to help others who have not similarly dispossessed would need no such help is disgusting. In other words, what Humphreys is saying is if he had the use of Burling's brigade, he not only would have stopped the Confederate advance, he probably could have advanced himself and really driven it back. But he doesn't have it. It was siphoned off to help support other parts of the line that had no reserves. On July 3rd, near sunrise, the division's going to be moved to the left and rear to resupply. They're then massed behind the 1st and 2nd Corps along Cemetery Ridge. Then they'll move to support the 5th Corps down the area of the Round Tops. And then finally, about 4.30, they'll move back to support the 1st and 2nd Corps. So they do a lot of moving along Cemetery Ridge on July 3rd, but they miss out on any action. By the time they get to where they're supposed to go, the battle is already over. On July 4th, 5th, and 6th, the division is going to be busy bringing in the wounded and burying the dead. On July 7th, at 3 o'clock in the morning, they start to march off the battlefield towards Emmitsburg, Maryland. And on July 8th, Humphreys will finally accept Meade's offer to be chief of staff for the Army of the Potomac. And he's going to lead the division at that point. But all together, Humphrey's division of 4,924 officers and men reported total losses of 314 killed, 1,562 wounded, and 216 missing or captured, by 42.5%. So seventh highest, it's the third highest loss for the Union divisions here at Gettysburg, and the seventh highest percentage loss. Carr's brigade of 1,718 men lost 790. Brewster with 1,837 lost 778. And all of Brewing's brigade's individual regiments, starting out with 1,365 officers and men, lost 513. The Confederates in attacking those 4,000 men lost 1,980 officers and men roughly 48 percent and sometimes if you want to try to gauge how successful somebody is one gauge of success is if you can inflict more damage on the enemy than they inflict on you Humphreys lost 2,092 men he caused the Confederates to lose 1,980 so based on raw numbers it goes to the Confederates but Humphreys only lost 42 percent of his men the Confederates lost 48. So percentage-wise, the Confederates have more losses than Humphreys does. So it's kind of a drawing here all together. But Humphreys does a good job of getting his division out of here and then reforming it. And unlike the third division of the Fifth Corps, Humphreys was very proud of this division. I think the difference was when he takes command of this division, It already has a good fighting reputation. So even though they're volunteers, it's a good group of men. And Humphreys recognizes that. When he left the div and Humphreys will remain chief of staff of the Army of the Potomac until November of 1864. And at that point, he's appointed commander of the Union Army Second Corps. And in place of Major General Winfield Scott Hancock. Humphreys will stay in the Army 
uh, rise to the rank of chief engineer for the U.S. Army and retire by 20 years after the Civil War. But he also is known in his farewell address to the division. In part of the celebrated division, after having commanded for the brief period of 50 days, I trust that I may be excused for expressing my admiration for its high soldierly qualities. It is impossible to pass it in review even without perceiving that its ranks are filled with men who are soldiers in the best meaning of the term, and that it possesses in the grade of commissioned officers men whose skill, courage, and accomplishments would grace any service. I want to thank you folks for joining me this afternoon for the battle walk. I'll be here again for a few minutes in case you have any questions. For those who want to head back to your cars, there's two ways you can do it. You can follow the horse trail back here, which will take you back to the Tulsa Farm, or you can follow down Sickles Avenue to U.S. Avenue, make a left, and that will also take you back. But once again, I want to thank you folks for joining me today and for coming to Gettysburg. Thank you.